Yeah. Okay, we are live. So welcome everyone to this special installment of the West Virginia Rivers Coalition Climate and Water Lunch and Learn series on environmental justice. I'm Autumn Crow, staff scientist at West Virginia Rivers, and I'll be moderating this webinar. During the Climate and Water and Justice webinar, West Virginia Rivers is hosting Dr. Georgiana Logan with her presentation entitled Climate Change, Health and Equity Among Minority and Vulnerable Populations, a Public Health Approach to Environmental Justice. Dr. Logan is an Assistant Professor of Health Science and a Research Associate for the Minority Health Institute at Marshall University, who is one of our nation's leading experts on climate, public health, and environmental justice. Currently, she is also serving a two-year term on the American Public Health Associates, Association's Center for Climate, Health, and Equity Inaugural Advisory Board. She also has some special guests joining her today who I will let her introduce. So before we get started, just a few housekeeping items. This session is being recorded and will be emailed to you following the presentation. It will also be available on our website, wvrivers.org, and we are also broadcasting live on Facebook. Please make sure you mute your microphone during the presentation and following Dr. Logan's presentation, there will be time for questions which you may enter in the chat box. What the fuck? The webinar has also been approved it's for a one hour category one continuing social work education applicable to the renewal of the West Virginia social work license. WV Board of Social Work approved provider, Marshall University Social Work Department, in collaboration ah. with the National Association of Social Workers West Virginia Chapter. To verify participation and request a certificate of attendance, please email the subject July Climate Webinar to admin.naswwv at socialworkers.org no later than July 30th, 2020. And I will um, also drop that information into the chat box. So with that, I will turn it over to Dr. Logan. Thank you, Autumn. Welcome everyone to today's presentation on climate change, health and equity among minority and vulnerable populations, a public health approach to environmental justice. I want to express thank you to West Virginia Rivers Coalition for this opportunity, and we hope you enjoyed today's presentation. All right, so just a quick introduction. I am Dr. Georgiana Logan, Assistant Professor at Marshall University and Research Associate within the Minority Health Institute here at Marshall University in the Department of Health Science. And my special guest for today is LaDonna Walker-Dean, who is the West Virginia Minority Health Coordinator for the state of West Virginia. She oversees all 55 counties and she's currently located at Marshall University within the Department of Public Health. And then we have Sydney Blackburn, who's an undergraduate student at Marshall University in the Department of Health Science. And Sydney also serves as the Undergraduate Health Science Society President. All right, so we have a few learning objectives associated with today's presentation. So by the end of the presentation, we hope participants will be able to identify principles of environmental justice, describe how the environment may play a role in the health outcomes for communities of color and vulnerable populations, and discuss the intersectionality between climate change and health equity. So why are we here? What's the purpose of today's talk? Well, stories around climate change and environmental justice are not new. In fact, they are occurring all across the world. So let's just dive right into it. So when we talk about environmental justice, we have to first describe what we mean when we're talking about the environment. So what we know about the environment is that the environment is a leading determinant of health and well-being. And we know social determinants of health, those conditions in which people are born, grow, live, work, and play are important factors and the health and well being of individuals and communities. So, this concept of environment must include both the physical, built, and social environments, as well as the interactions and connections between them. So, when we say the physical environment, 
we're talking about the natural environment that are your that's your plants, air, water, and weather. When we talk about the built environment, that's infrastructure such as buildings, roads, parks, and sidewalks. And the social environment is the combination of cultural and social institutions, norms, beliefs, and policies that influence the life of an individual or community. And so since we're talking about environmental justice, the Environmental Protection Agency or the EPA defines environmental justice as the fair treatment and meaningful involvement of all people, regardless of race, color, national origin or income with respect to the, the development, implementation and enforcement of environmental laws, regulations and policies. So environmental justice seeks to address the disproportionate environmental risks by low income communities and communities of color resulting from poor housing, poor nutrition, unsafe neighborhoods, lack of access to health care, un underemployment and employment in the most hazardous jobs. So let me give you a brief history of the environmental justice movement. So it started in 1982 in Warren County, North Carolina, where the state government wanted to dump thousands of truckloads of soil laced with PCBs. And so the community just was not going for this. And so they held six weeks of marches and nonviolent protests, and more than 500 people were arrested as a result. So these were the first arrests in US history over the sitting of a landfill. So community members tried to stop them by lying down in the roads lead to the landfill. So the people just couldn't have access to that space. Now the people of Warren County ultimately lost this battle and the toxic waste were eventually deposited in that landfill, unfortunately. And then there are many other earlier examples in history about environmental justice movements from Cesar Chavez, who fought for workplace rights for Latino farm workers, including protection from harmful pesticides in San Joaquin Valley in California, to African Americans in the late 60s in Houston, who fought and opposed the city garbage dump in their community that had reportedly claimed the lives of two children, and the list goes on and on. However, Warren County protests marked the first instance of an environmental protest by people of color that garnered widespread national attention. And if you'd like to learn more, the EPA has this wonderful timeline event regarding the environmental justice movement in which you can learn more. And so eventually people got fed up with the injustices that were taking place. And the first, the delegates to the first national people of color, which was comprised of Native Americans, African Americans, Latinos, Asians, and Pacific Islanders, held an environmental leadership summit in October of 1991 in Washington, DC. And while they were there, they drafted and adopted 17 principles of environmental justice, which serves as a defining document for the grassroots movement for environmental justice as we know today. Now this ultimately led to the Office of Environmental Equity being formed in 1992. And in 1994, the name changed to the Office of Environmental Justice, which we know today. And I'm not gonna read through all of these principles of environmental justice. Um, you guys will have it in a recorded presentation as well. Just too many to go through in the time frame. There's 17 of them. All right, let's go a step further. So the establishment of the Office of Environmental Justice was huge and led to some great research and works being done early on to address environmental justice. And President Clinton signed an executive order in 1994 to address environmental justice in minority and low income populations. Now, why is this so special? So this order was the first major federal action on environmental justice in the United States and required that all federal agencies make achieving environmental justice part of its mission by identifying and addressing as appropriately disproportionate high and adverse human health or environmental effects of its programs, policies, and activities on minority populations and low income populations. So many of these communities lack basic environmental benefits like healthy home free of toxins, access to open spaces like parks, the availability of healthy foods, and safe and affordable public transportation. So this order brought attention to the environmental justice movement and opened up the door to talk about our next set of definitions. 
So when we talk about environmental justice, we must also talk about environmental injustice. And environmental injustice is defined as disproportionate exposure to pollution and its effect on health and the environment, as well as the unequal environmental protection and environmental quality provided through laws, regulations, government programs, enforcement, and policies. And then alongside that definition is environmental racism, which is any environmental practice or policy that differentially affects or disadvantages, whether intentionally or unintentionally, individuals, groups, or communities based on color. Now, I know some people hear the term racism and get uptight, but until you talk about race as a social construct that has been and still is embedded in all social structures, you can't fully address the isms, the injustices, biases, and acts that are perpetuated at individual, interpersonal, community, organizational, and policy levels. So we must get comfortable talking about things that are uncomfortable and may be unfamiliar to us. So therefore, when we examine environmental injustice and racism, we look at it from the lens of an overburdened community, which are your minority, low income, tribal, or indigenous populations or ge geographic locations that experience disproportional environmental harms and risks that contribute to environmental health disparities. So acts of environmental injustice and environmental racism have led to environmental health disparities. These disparities exist when communities exposed to a combination of poor environmental quality and social inequities have more sickness and disease than wealthier, less polluted communities. So let's check a few of these out. So when we talk about the physical environment and the disparities we see in asthma related statistics, people of color are more likely to experience disproportionate exposures to particulate matter and ozone pollution. And this is a result of things such as indoor triggers, such as secondhand smoke, dust mite, pets with fur or feathers, household pests, mold, household sprays, nitrogen dioxide if they have gas appliances, all these things that can make asthma worse or provoke asthma attacks. And then we know communities of color also have plenty of outdoor triggers that also lead to the rates we see in the disparities in asthma such as high levels of air pollution, so ozone, ozone nitrogen oxides, um, aerosols and fine particles, um, which also is associated with making asthma worse for these communities. These pollutants can also come from smoke, dust, emission from cars, factories, and power plants. All right, let's go a step further. So when we talk about the built environment and its contribution to obesity epidemic, we're talking about how predominantly minority communities in rural areas have fewer grocery stores and less access to affordable healthy foods. We're talking about how poor neighborhoods disproportionately lack outdoor recreation spaces that are safe and offer few opportunities for biking and walking trails. And some of the statistics that you see on here are from the CDC um, and report that they had reported not too long ago. So in 2018, non-Hispanic Blacks were 1.3 times more likely to be obese as compared to non-Hispanic whites. African-American women have the highest rates of obesity with four out of five African-American women being overweight or obese. And in 2018, we know that African Americans were 20% less likely to engage in physical activity and compared to non-Hispanic whites. And we know people who are overweight are more likely to suffer from high blood pressure, high cholesterol, and diabetes, all leading to some of these chronic health conditions such as heart disease and stroke. Another example of the built environment and its effects can be seen in housing. So the causes of res residential segregation are complex. We have issues with zoning, transportation, why highways and railroads are placed where they are in community, redlining, et cetera. And we wouldn't have enough time to discuss them all. However, the point we are trying to make is that most American communities remain segregated by race and the harmful effects of government-backed segregation produced by racial inequities and increased exposure to environmental hazards that we still witness today. And so we know that black households or communities of colors are three times as likely as whites to live in older, deteriorated, crowded, and, and or substandard homes with building codes and violations due to severe problems with heating and cooling, plumbing, electricity, and maintenance. And this sets up an environment for infectious and chronic diseases, injuries, and adverse child development outcomes. 
one of which we're getting ready to talk about. So we know the issues of lead poison are happening all over right now, especially with reports within the last couple of years. So for example, the Flint water crisis. Now I am a native of Flint, Michigan, where the water crisis is huge. It started in 2014, it's still currently happening now. And so it's reported that an estimated 3.6 million American homes with at least one child have significant lead hazards. And this can come from a number of factors such as contaminated drinking water, which is like in Flint, Michigan, soil, house dust, chip paint, and it also can be passed on from mom during and after pregnancy. And one of the things that we know is that a lot of these communities of color and people who experience these lead adversities um, are at an increased risk of nutritional deficiency. So they have low levels of iron, calcium, vitamins, and magnesium to kind of help combat the effects of lead absorption. And we know that they can have detrimental effects on children's health as well as adult health as well. In regards to the social environment, uh, traditional occupational health research has focused on physical hazards such as exposure to chemical agents, or dangerous and physically demanding tasks or environments. However, we know that occupational health inequities are affordable differences in work-related disease incidents, mental illness or morbidity and mortality that are closely linked with the social, economic, and or environmental disadvantages such as work arrangements. So what we're talking about is that workers in low status and low wage jobs who are often minorities face increased occupational hazards including chemical exposures, poor working conditions, and psychosocial stressors. So for many minorities and your immigrant workers, for example, who work in short-term seasonal or subcontractor positions, employers may not invest many resources in their safety. And because of these power dynamics between the employer and an employee, some workers may be reluctant to refuse hazardous tasks because their primary concern may be to provide for themselves and their family, and they cannot afford to lose work or be deported. Let's go a step further. All right, so environmental pollutants can have detrimental effects also among pregnant women and the birth outcomes that we see. So this is problematic because evidence has shown that there exists a relationship between socioeconomic status and pregnancy outcomes as well as socioeconomic status and environmental exposures. And so what we're saying is that minority women uh, and people of color and vulnerable population have increased exposures to air pollution, lead, pesticides, all linked to preterm birth, low birth weight babies, and miscarriages for pregnant women. So when we talk about vulnerable populations a little bit further, Many rural areas, specifically for West Virginia, are populated by whites, just because of the demographics, and LaDonna will talk more about that. But in some of these rural areas, you see similar problems related to poverty, unemployment, low-wage work, limited education, poor housing, limited access to health care if the health reform hasn't been expanded in those areas, high rates of obesity, food insecurity, agricultural exposures due to the nature of the work, and then limited access to health information technology for many, many reasons. And then when we talk about the extreme weather events, specifically for climate change and communities of color and vulnerable population, the severity and extent of health effects associated with extreme weather events depend on the physical impacts of the extreme events themselves, as well as the societal and environmental circumstances at the time and place where events occur. So we know that pre-existing social and health inequalities or health disparities shape the outcome that individual and communities will experience as a result of climate change and extreme weather due to exposure, which is the contact between a person and one or more biological, psychosocial, chemical, or physical stressors, including stressors affected by climate change, sensitivity, which is the degree to which people or communities are affected either adversely or beneficially by climate variability and change, and then their adaptive capacity, which is the ability of communities, institutions, or people to adjust to potential hazards, to take advantage of opportunities, or to respond to the consequences. So when we talk about these extreme events, people of color and vulnerable populations have difficulty responding, evacuating, or relocating when necessary, and recovering from events related to health impacts, such as like Hurricane Katrina when it happened. 
And so we are currently under the Environmental Justice Action Plan for 2020. So much like No Can People 2020, which sets the nation's health agenda, the EPA developed an Environmental Justice Action Agenda or strategic plan for advancing environmental justice for the year 2016 through 2020. So they have three overarching goals, with 12 priority areas, and you can see them on the diagram below. However, our goals center around taking action to address environmental injustices and shedding light and reducing cumulative impacts of health for minorities and vulnerable communities. So how do we do this? So when we talk about our goals that align with the Environmental Justice Action Plan, we often use Bloom's taxonomy when motivating communities to take action. And Bloom's taxonomy is a learning, um, a learning profile, um, so higher learning profile. So we focus on moving beyond just distributing information. So that's like flyers, pamphlets, hosted health fairs, to getting communities to mobilize and engage in community initiatives that promote system-wide changes that directly and indirectly impact health. And so LaDonna, who was one of our special guests, will talk about the Minority Health Institute and the collaboration and projects we are currently working on to address environmental injustices and help improve some of the health disparities that are plaguing minorities and vulnerable communities in West Virginia. And so I'll turn it over to LaDonna. LaDonna? It would help if I would unmute myself. Thank you, Dr. Lennon, once again, for giving me this opportunity to talk about the Minority Health um, Institute and the Minority Health Disparities for the state of West Virginia. Next slide. I will briefly talk about the Office of, an, of Minority Health Mission Statement. And we came up with this mission statement and the mission statement of West Virginia Office of Minority Health is to improve and protect the health and well-being of racial and ethnic minorities through the development of programs, policies, and practices to eliminate health disparities in the state of West Virginia. The Office of Minority Health, its purpose is to serve as a resource and a collaborative partner to community organizations, healthcare providers, and government agencies in efforts to decrease mor morbidity and mortality in minority populations. Lastly, what I do is I coordinate statewide efforts to reduce health inequity for vulnerable populations as defined by race, ethnicity, social economic status, geography, age, disability status, and among other populations identified to be at risk for health disparities. And what are health disparities? I was, um, I took this position almost two years ago, going on three years roughly, and I really didn't know what health disparities are or were. Raise your hand if, if you know currently what a health disparity is. particular type of health difference that is closely linked with social, economic, and or environmental disadvantage. Health disparities adversely affect groups of people who have systematically experienced greater obstacles to health based on the following race, ethnicity, gender, income, disability, um, a gender unicorn, as, as we said, and so in world environment. So I want everyone to stretch your arms and stretch your voices and repeat after me. You guys ready? Okay. Now repeat after me. If you are not the majority, you are, you are not, not the majority. majority. You are the minority. You, you are, the, are minority. the minority. Good job. So moving forward, always keep that in mind. A lot of people think when they think of minorities, they think of African Americans, they think of people of color. And in West Virginia, we're going to talk about the population and demographics. I'm from Huntington, West Virginia. And so therefore, as you can see on the slide, West Virginia counts, there's 1.6 million white people in West Virginia. 
Black or African American constitutes for 65,000. As you all can see, it gets lower and lower, you know, among uh, the demographics um, of West Virginia. So when we talk about minorities, we're also talking about rural counties in West Virginia, and I'll talk about that later in the next slides. And so really quickly, if you back it up to the slide, as you all can see, West Virginia is surrounded by Ohio, Pennsylvania, DC, Washington, and Virginia. So when we talk about the Northern Panhandle, when we talk about the Eastern Panhandle, those types of counties in West Virginia are located near Washington, DC. So you're gonna find a, a huge difference in the income level. All right, and Maryland as well, DC, Maryland area as well. So the income level on those counties are gonna be much, much more higher than when you get down into the Southern parts of West Virginia. Now the census informed me about two years ago when I was doing research on populations, current populations in West Virginia, that the Hispanic population, which is an ethnicity, can count themselves as white or black. Now I have my um, own mind frame towards that, but the majority of Hispanics, they do count themselves as white. And so we can, you guys can ask more questions to that. I've asked the census um, how they feel about that and they really could not give me a clear answer on why that is. So now we can move to the next slide. Health disparities in West Virginia. Mortality in West Virginia is severely high. As doing research, heart disease mortality rate is 19% higher than the national rate. Cancer mortality rate is 17% higher than the national rate. Diabetes, we can go down and look at the slides. Chronic um, obstructive pulmonary disease, COPD, in infant mortality rate, stroke mortality rate is severely higher than the national rate. When we look at the data for the West Virginia Behavioral Risk Factor Surveillance Report, um, there is no reported health disparity data that takes into account race and ethnicity across the multiple measures. However, you all, what we do know is from the 2007 Office of Minority Health report to the latest 2012 regular report is that African Americans bear the burden of disease for many health indicators that can be contributed to a number of things with the environment being one of those indicators. And what we see in West Virginia is that African Americans have a higher overall mortality rate in both the state and the nation than whites. African American residents were significantly more likely than whites and persons of other races to have been diagnosed with hypertension. When we talk about hypertension, that's high blood pressure, and that talks about, we're gonna get closer into talking about food insecurities and eating healthy. African Americans in West Virginia, um, they had the higher rates of mortality from diabetes. Specifically type 2 diabetes, African-American males, they, had di they were diagnosed with type 2 diabetes and they died. Now everyone knows, if you don't know already, type 2 is a preventive disease. You can prevent type 2. African-American residents also had a higher rate with cancer, 20% higher than that of residents, and that's a mortality rate as well. The percentage of premature births among African-American women was higher than that among white women in the state. African-American mothers and mothers of other races in West Virginia were more likely to give birth to a low birth rate than African-American women in that state. And lastly, African-American residents have the higher rates of asthma than whites. If we back it up, um, my friend, and colleague Dr. Louis Andrews has been doing research on the west side of Charleston, West Virginia, where there are they are they have higher rates of African American babies dying within the first 28 days of life and the first year of life. And she is currently doing research on that infant mortality rate in Charleston, West Virginia. Which leads to the next slide. The Community Garden Initiative, um, as we know. 
it really constitutes in a healthy eating. You can do, you can prevent a lot of these diseases if we can only eat right. And so we, the Office of Minority Health met with the Cabell Huntington Hospital's CEO, Kevin Fowler, almost a year and a half ago. We brought him the idea of developing community gardens in African American minority neighborhoods. And so they, they got on board, they donated $25,000 to the Office of Minority Health to address obesity and food insecurities among minority communities. We partnered with the YMCA who already had a community um, garden on the south side of Huntington, West Virginia. So we had Marshall University public health master students to come and tend to that garden. And we also partnered with Positive People Association, which is an African-American owned business um, in the African-American predominantly community in Huntington, West Virginia. And so we are developing community gardens in those areas. And the goal is to develop and promote community gardens and to promote healthy eating, which we know that is not occurring in African Americans, and I'll let you all know why in the next slide. But first, we know that policy and system changes take time. So right now we are doing those things that focus on short-term and intermediate changes in our communities. Many low-income minority and rural neighborhoods lack full-service grocery stores and farmers markets uh, where healthy food can be purchased. According to the USDA, West Virginia has the highest average in the nation with food insecurities. That's more than 40 countries are considered food deserts in West Virginia. And we know a food desert is an area where people don't have access to fresh fruit, veggies, and other whole foods that promote good health. And the next slide, so I was doing research. And like I told you, I'm from Huntington, West Virginia. And what I've noticed is Huntington, West Virginia is the second most populous city in West Virginia. And we're also one of the most diverse cities as well. There are no grocery stores in predominantly African American neighborhoods, none at all. I also did some research in Charleston, West Virginia, which is one of the number one populous cities in West Virginia and one of the most diverse cities as well. There were no grocery stores in predominantly African American neighborhoods. So therefore, when we talk about the built environment, it is so crucial to begin the conversation of food insecurities and ways to introduce policies that will impact communities in West Virginia to develop farmers markets and grocery stores in minority communities, as well as community gardens to promote healthy eating and fresh food. And the next slide, we have partnered with a lot of agencies and a lot of communities for the past two years. We want to get the name out of the Office of Minority Health, Minority Health Institute. It is it is existing, it's live, and we actually partnered with the Herbert Henderson Office of Minority Affairs. They're located at the Capitol in Charleston, West Virginia. They did a bridge grant program, and the bridge acronym stands for Building Resources in Diverse Geographic Environments. Um, it is a comprehensive community revitalization effort with a mission of addressing poverty, improving community-wide um, health, simulating labor forces, and so forth, as you all can read in through the slides. And so we, we did the grant, and we the grant was a program to reduce the burden of health disparities among minority populations in Kanawha County in West Virginia. And we are awarded $25,000 on this February. As you all can see the picture, Executive Director Jill Upson of the Office of Minority um, Affairs and Jim Justice, they gave us the award. And workshops will be conducted to inform and educate the minority community about disparities in terms of incident prevalence, morbidity, and mortality related to chronic health conditions in Kanawha County um, in Charleston, West Virginia. And also keep in mind really briefly um, that in order for the, the Office of Minority Health to be funded, you know, we have to, of course, get federal and state dollars. And that is something that we'll talk about later on um, in this presentation. Um, but for now, always keep in mind um, that if you are not the majority, you are the minority. And thank you. 
Thank you, LaDonna and Dr. Logan. Um, as Dr. Logan stated earlier, my name is Sydney Blackburn and I'm the president of the Health Science Society, uh, which is an undergraduate student organization at Marshall University. Um, so first I would like to talk about intersectionality between climate change and environmental justice. Um, so I wanna define climate vulnerability and climate resistant or resilience. Uh, so climate vulnerability is the degree to which people or communities are at risk of experiencing the negative impacts of climate change. And then climate resilience is the capacity to anticipate, plan for, and reduce the dangers of the environmental and social changes brought about the climate change and to seize any opportunities associated with these changes. Um, so environmental injustices, including like climate change, um, have a disproportionate impact on communities of color and vulnerable communities in the U.S. globally. And climate vulnerability and resilience intersects with um, environmental justice. So when we talk about climate change and environmental justice, intersectionality means everyone has multiple overlapping aspects of their identities and all of these connect together to shape how we experience the world and how we are treated within it. Um, so this can go, for example, as in uh, race, gender, class, sexual orientation, age, disability, etc. And these aspects don't exist separately from each other. Uh, so the Health Science Society at Marshall University was one of five colleges around the world to win a Student Champions for Climate Justice Award from the American Public Health Association, or APHA for short, to provide an on-campus experience about climate change to our region. Um, our goals of the events is to raise awareness about climate change and environmental justice, and we hope to do that by defining and discussing the importance of climate change in public health and health equity, and we want to talk about key signs of climate change and its potential effects in West Virginia and the Appalachian region. Um, as a group, we hope to come up with some strategies and solutions for climate change and health equity initiatives in West Virginia. Um, so we have a full week of events and originally the event was to be hosted during National Public Health Week, which was April 6th through the 12th of 2020. But due to COVID-19 and the changes that have come with it, the event will now be hosted on October 19th through the 23rd, um, which is National Health Education Week. And the following events will be hosted in a virtual capacity or in person following CDC guidelines for interactions for a larger group. So the first event we have is a movie screening for students and, commu and the community followed by a panel discussion, which will be led by professors and students on climate change and health equity. Then we will have a climate change and health equity paint and sip, um, a climate change social hour to discuss topics related to climate change and environmental justice. Um, and then finally, we will have a climate change and health equity game night. And these events will be free for all students and the community members of Huntington. All right, thank you, Sydney. And so where do we hope to go from here? So people always ask me, Dr. Logan, what the heck are you working on? What do you have up your sleeve? And so I always break things down in between my teaching, research, and service commitments. And so for as far as teaching, either in the college, the courses that I teach, or in the community, we hope to do, be able to do some windshield tours of certain communities with COVID going on. We don't know how successful that may be at the moment uh, with social distancing. We love doing lunch and learns just to educate and inform people. And then in all of my classes, uh, my classes really center around a lot of student involvement. So I teach in the Masters of Public Health program at Marshall, and I also teach in the undergraduate health science uh, program. And so student involvement is huge for us because we have a lot of students at Marshall who are interested in some form of a healthcare career. And so we try to let them experience health outside of what you learn in your like biology or other physical science courses. So we try to get them to understand the factors that influence health and well being and those things that contribute to the conditions and diseases and the patients that they will probably end up working with. And then with research, so like LaDonna said, LaDonna is the minority health coordinator for the state of West Virginia. She oversees all 55 counties by herself. We really need to give her a hand clap. 
And so LaDonna is currently working on, even with our assistance, the Minority Health Profile for West Virginia. We don't have one currently. Um, and so it's a lot, a lot of work that goes into that. And I salute LaDonna for all of her hard work and efforts. We also do a lot of community-based initiatives, a lot of which LaDonna has already touched on. So we do a lot of CVPR work. We actually want to get out and start doing community assessments in neighborhoods that maybe not have been thought of. We also talked about doing some GIS mapping opportunities, so some spatio location mapping, where we start to overlay like these health disparities and these environmental hazards on top of each other based on zip code or counties. We always are looking for more grants to write because again, you need money to be able to do a lot of the work that we do. And then I was investigating and I found on the CDC website that they have this National Environment Public Health Tracking System. And so far, I think it's like 14 states that have been awarded uh, a position in their public health tracking program. And I didn't see West Virginia being a grantee of their program. So I really, really want to investigate in that because we have a lot of environmental things that's happening in West Virginia. So how can we become a grantee of this program? As far as service, again, LaDonna mentioned we do a lot of community garden initiatives. So we're assisting communities in growing gardens. We want to test their soil and water in these communities. We promote the raised flower beds, so like the makeshift gardens. Oh, uh, and then we ultimately want to be able to host a community garden fair each year. So where we take people all around Huntington or various other areas and really go and look at uh, people community gardens in these communities. Hopefully we'll be able to have enough fruits and veggies and good produce to have a mobile food pantry so we can get to some of these areas that really don't have access to the healthy foods that they need. And then we're also currently in the works of trying to address obesity in the built environment. So we're looking to host these physical activity camps with churches. So we want to have a safe place where residents can come work out, get instructions uh, from different uh, people on different kind of uh, workout practices. Um, and the like, so we can kind of get these rates of obesity under control. And so with that being said, that is the end of our presentation. I don't know. I want to ask Donna and Sydney if they have anything else to add. And if you want to learn more information about what we have going on, either with my research, my students, or talk to LaDonna specifically, uh, our email address is on here, so you have access to it. Please send us an email. We are very, very responsive. Um, we love reworking with many different organizations. Some we haven't, so we'd like to establish like those collaborative partnerships. So please, please, please reach out to us, um, and we'd be more than willing to have a conversation with you about what we're doing or what we could do as uh, potential uh, partners. So LaDonna and Sydney, anything else left to add? Uh, no, I think you covered it. Yes, I think you did a great job. All right, so Autumn, we'll turn it back over to you because we know we have a question and answer session. And so we'll kind of let you lead those efforts. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Logan, LaDonna, and Sydney. Um, this is now the question and answer portion. So if you have any questions, you can enter them into the chat box. Um, I've been monitoring it and I know we have had a couple questions come in during the presentation. One is related to pollution in communities. Uh, the question was how to report pollution in communities. Do you have an answer to that? Okay, so as far as um, reporting pollution in communities, uh, there is an EPA website where you can go in and you can report the co uh, concerns in the community and then I'm not sure about a local establishment just yet, but I can find that information out for you. Yes, I can answer that also, um, because we do have a technical assistance program where citizens can pollute, can uh, report pollution to myself at um, Autumn Crow at wvrivers.org. Okay. A Crow. Um, and there is also the West Virginia DEP also mm -hmm. has a, um, a complaint uh, hot, a citizen complaint hotline to report uh, like spills and stuff. And then um, there's also a website where people can be anonymous when they report those um, pollution issues. So I can drop that um, into the chat box. Thank you, Autumn. And let's see, um, there was some questions about 
the definition of a food desert, um, there was some people chatting about um, access to grocery stores in Charleston. Um, can somebody answer that question? Right. Well, well, when researching, I spoke with a community activist, African-American community activist, and she, she does a lot of photos in Charleston, and she was telling me that there are not any grocery stores. There's no farmer's market. And when she said that, she, we, we, we both talked about it, and the same thing is going on in Huntington and other communities as well, especially rural communities. They have your Walmarts, you have your Piggly Wigglies, but they're far distance, meaning that people who don't have transportation they either have to call a taxi, right? Or take a bus. And could you imagine traveling 15, 20 minutes to a grocery store, maybe even 30 minutes to a grocery store, getting off on the bus, getting off in a taxi, and really grocery shopping? How many people do you know are, are gonna do that? There's gonna be very few. And that's why you see Walgreens popping up, you see dollar stores popping up, but how much do you think a loaf of bread is at a Walgreens? or at your CVS. Five dollars a loaf, it's very, the, the rates are very high, so that leads to people going to what? McDonald's, Little Caesars, getting a five dollar pizza because that's all they can afford because they have to think about, they have children in the household too, and the income levels are low in West Virginia, and so you have to think about it. Do I want to spend money on a taxi? Do I want to be around crowded people on a bus with 50,000 groceries? Then I have to unload the groceries off the bus, off the taxi, and then go take it to my house. And that's a lot of things I never even thought about. And so we were having the conversation of that. And so that's why you may have these grocery stores on the west side of Charleston, but how many people actually have transportation to actually walk to these stores and things like that? And just to piggyback, I'm sorry, Ladon, I didn't mean to cut you off. Just to piggyback on you as well, when we think about food desert, it's those locations where it's difficult to buy affordable or good quality fresh mm -hmm. food. So if you're from Huntington or even in your other communities where you may be located, specifically for Kroger that's located on Fifth Avenue, the way that Kroger is set up and the way that it looks is totally different than the Kroger if you go, for say, out to like Barbersville, where they have the fresh deli, you can get fresh salads made. The quality of the food and the produce is a little bit different in comparison to the grocery store, the Kroger's over on Fifth Avenue. And so those are the things that we're talking about and pointing out as far as in the built environment of uh, those things that we see on a, a basis. Mm -hmm. It's true. So you do have you do have those grocery stores, um, but as far as location goes, because as we all know, I don't know how many people are from West Virginia. Our geography is, is kind of tough. You know, we got the hills. You know, we got the mountains and things like that. And some is city, some is rural, but we're more of a rural Appalachia in West Virginia. Thank you. We have another question, actually a couple questions about um, policy changes or legislative changes that could address these inequities. And so right now, oh, go, go ahead, Ladonna. Ladonna. No, you go ahead. <laughs> Well, the Office of Minority Health, you know, what we do is we, we do research and health promotion. And I'm the only one in the state of West Virginia that's overseeing 55 counties minority-wise. And so what we've noticed was when we receive state and federal funding regarding tobacco, regarding cancer, obesity, what have you, no funding is coming to the Office of Minority Health to address health disparities. And that is, that's been, a, that's been a major issue. And so we started the conversation of policies being taken place. The Herbert Henderson Office of Minority Affairs, you know, they deal with, they deal with policies because they're, 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 they're lo located at the state capitol. So that's why it's so important to have a relationship with the people, you know, um, with policies because we are not receiving funding. Other agencies are receiving funding, but we are not. And so we started the conversation just recently that if there's state and federal dollars coming into the state of West Virginia, the Office of Minority Health, Minority Health Institute should at least be receiving some of that funding because we do go out in the community. We are hands on 
out there in the community trying to help people as far as diabetes go. We did the National Diabetes Prevention Program. We're doing the community gardens. So we're out there. It's taking, a, of course, longer. I want to get across to 55 counties, um, but with funding, transportation, once again, it's very sparse. So, so I've made it, you know, my my passion is to contact leaders throughout the state of West Virginia to start the conversation because I can't do it all, but it's also good to have partnerships, collaboration, so we can all work together and be a cohesive team so we can address health disparities and other issues for the state of West Virginia. Thank you. Another question is about um, heat stress. Exposure to extreme heat is often an uh, um, underlooked and unappreciated aspect of climate change in the Appalachian region. Can you speak to the vulnerability of West Virginia communities from a public health perspective? So as far as the heat, the heat stress and <laughs> exposure to extreme heat, that is an area that we really have not looked into as of yet. We do a lot of stuff focusing on like the built environment and the social environment. But as I was doing my research, I also noticed that that was like a huge problem. And so I really, really need to pick back up some research and kind of look into that a little bit more. Okay, we also have a question about um, industrial facilities, uh, specifically the gas storage that is being sold as a job creator and economic boon for West Virginia, um, but will lead to exacerbating climate change and local pollution. Um, have you been working on that in a meaningful way in West Virginia? Um, so to answer your question, the answer would be no. Um, again, our climate change efforts in West Virginia, as far as minority and vulnerable populations, are really just starting to get underway um, as LaDonna keeps, again, working with this minority health profile and we keep seeing the disparities that are happening in certain areas. And so, no, but that would be very, very interesting. I'm trying to read this question myself. Um, Way. So I'm not sure if anyone is addressing that in a meaningful way in West Virginia or not. However, we could definitely check into that too. And if you send me an email, I'd be more than happy to look into that. Yeah, and we also have a response to that um, further down okay. in the chat box. Um, Ohio Valley Environmental Coalition, uh, West Virginia Rivers Coalition, Mid-Ohio Valley Climate Action, and Concerned Ohio River Residents are also working on the um, Appalachian Storage Hub. Okay, thank you. Um, there was a question a while back uh, about whether you guys are working with um, DHHR. Well, Donna, that's a question for you and the organizations that work with you or don't include you at the table. <laughs> yes, the, okay, so our funding source comes from the West Virginia Department um, of Health and Human Resources Bureau for Public Health. And they receive the state funding um, to fund uh, my salary and of course a little bit of travel. Um, so we are, I've been starting the conversation of developing relationships within the Bureau because they need of course to continue to help with the Minority Health Initiative um, so they did a memorandum of agreement almost two years ago, and the Office of Minority Health was in Charleston, West Virginia, at the Bureau, but um, Dr. Anthony Ward, who is the founder and director of the Minority Health Institute, um, they had a memor memorandum of agreement, and they moved the Office of Minority Health from Charleston, West Virginia, to Huntington, West Virginia, where we, we, were, we, we would get more support through Marshall University, um, and just more resources um, that way. And that's been an uphill battle as well um, to get uh, Marshall to um, pitch the idea of supporting the Minority Health Institute. Um, so yes, we do, we're starting the conversation with developing more, more partnership within the Bureau, um, which I have a, a developed partnership with tobacco, HIV AIDS, and things like that within the Bureau. And so they have started the conversation with when they receive state and federal funding, 
um, to make sure that the Minority Health Institute and the Office of Minority Health does not get left behind when it comes to funding. Thank you. Okay, it looks like we have a few more questions. Um, how does disparity in land ownership affect West Virginia citizens, minority or otherwise? As you know, it's, it's been affecting minorities for a long, long time. Um, but once again, if we can get these policies changed and start the conversation of fairness and justice for all, um, then I think uh, minorities um, can start um, living in suitable and adequate housing um, and they can start being homeowners, you know, um, and, and that starts from the top up and that starts from um, contracts, it starts from loans and things like that, that we've seen uh, unfairness for many, many decades with minorities with that. So it starts with policies and hopefully we're starting the conversation um, what's going on in the world today. Um, people are starting to speak up and people are, are taking a stand for everyone's rights, not just a particular um, group. And it's a beautiful thing. So hopefully we'll see some changes there because everyone deserves to live in a nice home. Everyone deserves to drink clean water. Everyone deserves to live in a free land. Everyone deserves to live um, without wondering if there's lead in your water, without wondering if there's pollution from these um, factories and plants that are coming in and polluting the water and polluting the, um, the area. So hopefully we're on to some, some changes there. Yes, thank you. Uh, another question is whether um, you're looking at the push for water privatization. Now that's something that we're not looking in. I don't know what you all are doing over there at West Virginia Rivers and if that's something that you would be looking in, it's like the transfer ownership of these different things. Are, is that something that you guys are working on, uh, Autumn? Um, we haven't recently, no. Okay, so no, we're currently not doing that either. Um, another question, are there any examples in other states where more resources uh, slash funding are being allocated to the equivalent office and programs? So again, like what Donna was saying, um, there's not a lot of focus on minority health in West Virginia. Even when we were given the disparities, the health disparities that exist, when you look at the latest BRFIS report, uh, across those measures, they don't even account for race and ethnicity in that national measure. But if you look at places like Michigan, they have a lot of resources that are being poured into like their cities and their counties and communities um, and being allocated to like um, sanitation of water and some of these other things that are uh, experiencing. So West Virginia does not have a lot of resources and funding currently in the Office of Minority Health and our programming, which is quite horrible, but we hope that that would increase so we can look like other states and address a lot of the things that we're seeing that are starting to pop up in this minority health profile. Mm -hmm. And then another thing, if I, if I might add, is that um, overseeing 55 counties in West Virginia, it, it can be difficult, but we also have to take into consideration there are a lot of counties that don't have any minorities. So I've done research on all the 55 counties and there's a lot of counties um, that don't have minorities at all. There's no diversity um, at all. Um, there's only a, a couple of counties like Mongolia, you have Morgantown and they count their students within their population, which is what you're gonna have a little bit more diversity, a whole lot more diversity there. You have Berkeley Jefferson, which Berkeley Jefferson is on the Eastern Panhandle and they're close to um, DC, Maryland. So people I've, I've researched, people in, the, in that area, they commute to Washington DC in Maryland and then they come back to live in West Virginia where there's a lower tax too. So, you know, so you're gonna have different counties that are a little bit more easier um, to oversee 
um, because there's a lot more diversity, but there's not a lot of diversity in West Virginia. And you can go back and look at that demographics and population and see it's only 36,000 African Americans. And that number gets lower when we talk about Asians and Mexicans, which Mexicans, they count themselves either as white or black. So that's another, um, can be another disparity um, as well. But they're all, but Mexicans, I found very interesting, is they are second in the state of West Virginia as far as income, income level. And in the United States, Mexicans, I think they are, they, they surpassed us as far as income goes as well. But I find it very interesting that they don't have to list themselves um, as a Mexican or ethnicity because they can choose between white or, white or black. So that's another, um, someone can research that and get back with me on that one. Too. Well, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Logan, LaDonna, and Sydney. Um, you guys are all doing amazing work, um, and we are happy to support you in sharing the work that you're doing to the public. We hope our viewers and listeners have learned from this discussion and are better equipped to talk about some of the environmental justice issues playing out in the climate crisis we are facing. Um, Please get involved with us at wvrivers.org or on our Facebook page to find out how you can get more involved in our climate campaign. So thank you all so much for joining us today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Baby fingers. <laughs>